Welcome to Stories from the Center of the Universe, the podcast about the human experience. Hi, Sherry Grinsteiner. Welcome to the Center of the Universe. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and this is not so much a center of the universe as Jerusalem, Israel is. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, for our purposes, it just means this conversation. And, and it's also an homage to the fact that I grew up in a town that has a slogan called Center of the Universe. I guess we, sh we should start with how you and I connected. Sure. So how did we connect? I, I received uh, a text or a phone call from you because you interviewed one of our friends uh, who was a guest at your show. And uh, I believe he spoke with you about uh, his family and a uh, story he has about his family from uh, as, as uh, uh, survivors of the Holocaust. And this is how Ben Ibsen, this is how you got to me. And uh, he told the story of his grandfather and mm -hmm. his great-grandfather. Yes. And his grandfather is one of the founders of the Virginia Holocaust Museum, uh, the oldest in the country, I yes. believe. And so I was very happy to talk to Ben. I'm, I'm ecstatic that Ben connected me to you because we're going to have a good conversation today. Well, thank you. All right, so you had some fun recently uh, in the city capitol at the House of Delegates. Tell me uh, what that was all about and what that experience was like. I did, I did. I was uh, invited to give the invocation, um, so it was just on Wednesday, and uh, it was very short. Just uh, you know, we, we, we received very clear instructions. It has to be less than uh, two minutes. Um, it was wonderful. For me, it was wonderful. Um, I... Um, I was standing there, uh, seeing everybody, seeing some friends in the balcony, and all I was thinking was, if uh, Sherry the immigrant who was uh, cleaning homes would um, have thought about it, if I could have sent her a picture of me standing there and giving the invocation in uh, the House of Delegates, and tell her, that's okay, in a few years, look where you're going to be. So it was very tremendous for me as an individual. I was also very, very proud to represent my congregation, congregation orated, and I was very proud to represent my faith. Um, after the invocation, I had one of the delegates actually coming to me and thanking me, uh, saying that it was um, really welcome to see a rabbi, a Jewish leader, um, faith leader being there and offering some words of uh, um, guidance, if you will, and, and just words of prayer. Do you, do you get the sense that that's not typical to have a, a rabbi or a Jewish leader at the House of Delegates? Uh, that, that was my understanding. I, I don't know. I haven't checked how many um, Jewish faith leaders had been there. I do not know, but that's how, that was my impression. Yeah, I've never been to the House of Delegates. You were asking me earlier if I've ever been there. Yeah. I, I, I haven't. I probably should, as a Virginia citizen, actually go to the House of Delegates in the other chamber of the, the Senate there. But uh, it was quite the experience, it sounds like. It, it was. It was. Uh, I am a very, very proud American. I, I am very proud Israeli. I'm extremely proud Jew. But I am very thankful for this country. I know that we have a lot of issues, a lot of problems. I mean, no question about it. Uh, but it is still one of the greatest countries in the world. Um, I, I am living the American dream, and I am, uh, again, grateful to be in this country. My husband is a Marine or ex-Marine. My son is, a, is also served as a U.S. Marine, and I cannot be more proud of the opportunities that this country provides us immigrants and uh, the freedom that we enjoy here, the uh, economic opportunities. I mean... You have thousands of people in the border trying to get to this country. There must be something that they know, and some of our own citizens refuse to understand. So I still um, see myself as privileged to um, to be living in this country. That does not negate my love and commitment and um, um, allegiance to the state of Israel, and obviously it does not come... <clears throat> in any way in contradiction to me being an Israeli or a Jew. It, it, um, both, all of those identity for me reflects who I am and reflect what is good and beautiful and um, work together. Israel and uh, America have a lot in common, uh, specifically the two largest Jewish populations on earth within sovereignties are Israel with roughly 7 million and I think America's second with about 6 million. Uh, and you were telling me something interesting when we met a couple of weeks ago what it's like to be an Israeli Jew versus what it's like to be an American Jew in terms of how you view the world around you. 
That's right. Uh, I think there's a there are more than there are about almost eight million Jews okay. in, in in Israel right now, maybe seven and a half or so, but a little bit more than six million. Um, this is the first time that there are more Jews in the state of Israel than in any one country around the world. Um, there's a big difference of uh, being an Israeli Jew. I think that the main thing is I um, I, I did not grow up as a minority in a different country. Um, we live to understand um, who we are as people, as a nation, as a, as a faith, and uh, have a very strong foundation in who we are. I think that coming here to the United States uh, showed me a whole different view about um, you know, the Jewish faith and Jews living in here. Um, so I am 100% Israeli, and the way I, I see things is through the lens of uh, of Israeli being a strong Jew, being a proud Jew, not not having to um, you know to hide who I am uh, and what I believe. I I I think that um, having communication with people that are not Jewish who would like to know more about the Jewish faith or or about Israel uh, is something I embrace and welcome at any given time. I think that um, from a growing up as a Jew in the U.S. Uh, the experience is just different when, when you are a minority. It's very different. It, it probably leads to uh, mistrust and maybe some fear born out of not understanding mm-hmm. everything around you because you don't want to put yourself out there necessarily. I'm sure. I'm sure. And, and I've heard many stories from uh, friends and congregants that in their uh, high school, they had to go through a lot of experiences of antisemitism. You know, for that matter, I can tell you that my children who grew up here as American Jews, um, have completely different experience than I did in my in my high school. Uh, they themselves had to to deal with uh, unwelcome um, comments, stereotypes in a way that made them feel very uncomfortable. Um, so my own children had to experience a slight anti-Semitism, if not a very clear and outright anti-Semitism from. Uh, friends and non-friends in their school. Um, I, I, I even recall a story that my son had shared with me that during his time as a, as a U.S. Marine, he had certain comments about um, um, physical characteristics of Jews that um, he was asked to show and, and clear, you know, one, one person had asked him to show his horns. And that was... That was here in the U.S. Uh, just about 10, 15 years ago. So you still have people that have those ideas about uh, Jewish people. Uh, born entirely out of what they've learned from those around them uh, and a lot of ignorance, just not understanding. Like, they probably don't know Jewish people. They probably don't understand Jewish people at um, a, a level that is deep trust, is my guess, the people that say things like that. I'm, I'm sure, and this is why I feel very comfortable, and I welcome any kind of dialogue um, and open open to conversation of who we are and what we are. I think that when you know the other, then um, you you open a channel of understanding and compassion uh, and empathy and sympathy with the others because they are not other anymore because you get to know them. So... This is probably the, one of the reasons why I'm open to have this conversation. There is no reason but to maybe expose myself a little bit and uh, as an Israeli, as a Jew, as a, a faith leader in the uh, Richmond community with the hope that this open an avenue for um, any kind of moving forward conversations. Anybody and everybody can, you know, pick up the phone and ask me questions. Um, the more we know each other... Um, the better we would be open to accept, to receive, and live in in peace and, and harmony with each other. And who doesn't <laughs> want peace and harmony? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. All right, so let's go back to the very beginning. Uh, at, at least, I mean, I'm, I'm intrigued by your family story. Where were your parents born? My parents were born and raised in Yemen, in a small village about four or five days walking from Sana'a, the, the capital of, of Yemen. So how did they eat? 
Where, where did the food come from? Um, they had a lot of grains. They, they had a lot of grains. My grandfather was a merchant. He would go and buy grains. They, you know, if they had any animals, then they would grow the anim, uh, animals. But mainly it was a lot of wheat and barley and uh, those kind of, um, um, you know, ingredients that would hold in, in the desert climate. So not fruits and vegetables necessarily? No. No, not a lot of fruit and vegetables. A, a lot of, if it would have been fruit, it would be dried, you know, dried dates, mm. um, dried figs. So, so not a balance, so. balanced diet the way you and I might think of today. Well, I would disagree with you. It's a very balanced diet. Oh, is it? Okay. Who, who, who assumes that what we are eating here today with all the meat and all, and all, all the, the hamburgers, yeah, yeah uh, who said that that is, you know, healthy diet. So I think that they probably had the best diet Um in fact, when they, when they, um, it was very well known in, in the village that I grew up, uh, a, v- a village with other Yemenite families, when they said that in Yemen we were very healthy, when we got to Israel and start eating all of these foods, we are not as healthy anymore. Uh, you know, the pro- processed foods, the sugar, the abundance of food, because when you have, um, you know, when you are used, when your body is used to a certain diet for hundreds mm-hmm. of years, and all of a sudden you change it drastically, well, your body reacts in a different way. So I would say that they ate a very balanced um, food for them at that time. They ate only what they needed. Uh, there was not a lot, um, but ate enough to survive. It worked for them. It worked for them. Yeah, when I said balanced diet, I was going back to my childhood when in school we learned about the food pyramid, which was grains, dairy, fruits and vegetables, and then I think meat was the fourth one. Uh, but that's been proven to be and, the wrong way And that way changed, of yes, that yeah. changed too. Uh, in fact, you know, now everybody talking about the Mediterranean diet that is the healthiest of all. We're talking about olives, right? So they had olives. So I think that um, um, they, 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 they did not have a lot. Um, at different times of history, they, they were um, at times that the Yemenite community um, had a lot of difficulty because of the um, of the ruling um, of, of you know the ruling sheikh or the imam or the ruling authority that was at the time. There was a lot of persecution, but from a food uh, point of view, I mean, I think that they were they never complained about the food. Let's put it this way. <laughs> no, it will obviously work for them. Yeah. So they, you have a thriving family yeah. today. Yeah. Are, your, are your parents still around? No, my parents passed away, but uh, I am. Uh, uh, blessed to have seven, um, six more brothers and sisters. My my mother had nine children, and there are seven of us right now. Uh, what number are you? I'm the last one. You're the youngest. I'm the youngest. You're the baby of babies. I am the baby. <laughs> I'm the the cutest, the baby, the loved one. I I had uh, five brothers. Wow. So I, I was always the the baby of the family. And you had brothers that looked out for you, I imagine. Always, yeah. always. So your parents were not only born and raised there, they were married in Yemen. Yes, yes. And then started having children. Yes. Um, my mom's firstborn was a little girl. Her name was Sarah, and she died when she was a toddler. Mm. Um, my mom says that she developed uh, ear, an earache, and at some point there was certain infection. And in Yemen, without any medical um provisions, medication, or any, any kind of care, she passed away. My mom also had a second son. His name was Shalom. And when they immigrated to Israel in 1949, Shalom was just about, I believe, seven or eight months old. Um, and my, my brother Shalom was killed in a scooter accident when oh. he was 21. Wow. Sorry for both of those. Yeah. Uh, how far was medical help away from when your parents were having children and raising them? in Yemen? I don't even know if they had it. I mean, uh, where is medical, uh, uh, where is the medical world today in Yemen? I don't think that they ever had it. So it was not even something that they would remotely think. It's not like they could jump on a car and, and drive, you know, for so many hours and, and get anywhere. It was not even something that they would factor into. It was not even something that they thought about. Yeah. It's life in Yemen. They, they did not have any running water. They did not have any electricity. Uh, my parents uh, never drove a car. My parents uh, never seen any of uh, you know the Western world um, progress until they came to the land of Israel. In fact, in 1949, when they when they um, were airlifted to Israel, 
Uh, why, were they, why were they airlifted? Um, during that time, it was right after the State of Israel was established, and um, at that time there were a lot of uh, animosity and uh, uh, hostility from the local, and, and that wasn't just in Yemen, that was all over the Arab uh, countries, hostilities against the Jews in, in those countries. And uh, my family, like many, many other Arab Jews uh, at that time, um, most of them had to leave the place where they grew up and been for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, like in, um, like in Iraq. And um, they were deported, deported from, from their cities, from their villages, and uh, told to leave and go to Israel. The State of Israel obviously opened, uh, opened up to receive all of those new immigrants that came from all of those Arab countries. My family was just one of them, as many other, there were about 50,000 Jews that were airlifted from Yemen. Mm. Um, and they were airlifted, there is like a big story with uh, Alaskan Airlines that were very much involved with, with this um, initiative and brought them into Israel. But many other Arab Jews left their Arab countries during those years, 49, you know, 1949, all the way to even the 60s. Uh, many of them had to leave abruptly and leave everything that they own um, in, in the countries that, um, that they had to leave. So before the late 40s, there was relative peace for your your parents and, and siblings? Well, it depends what you mean, peace. Um, for my family, they were as safe as can be under under the status of the Himis. The Himis were second-rate citizens in under the Muslim rules. Mm. So as the Himis, they had to pay jizya. Jizya was a tax that they had to pay uh, to ensure their protection by the local, either the local authority or, you know, the, the, the sovereign of the state, the imam at that time. And as the Himis, as second-rate citizens, again, they were protected. But what does that mean? It means that no one could kill them at any given time without permission. And as protected citizens, as second-rate citizens, they had the privilege to do specific tasks like um, to clean all the bathhouse and all the public bathrooms, um, like to clean all the dung left by the animals in the streets. Um, that was the quote-unquote privilege that they had to do. Um, the Jews in Yemen had uh, to had a lot of humiliation um, as as citizens again as as citizens of the country. I'll give you an example, and these are stories that my father told me. Um, and they are well, you know, they are in the history books. But what I'm sharing here is not uh, is not words of like, you know, a professor who knows about the life. I'm, I'm sharing with you what I've heard from my my uncles and my parents and my grandfathers. Um, they were not allowed um, to walk s uh, straight in front of a, of a Muslim, Yemeni Muslim. Uh, they had to move to the side. They had to cross the, the road and, and not to be on the same side of the road when there was a Muslim Yemeni walking in front of them. Uh, their houses had to be built lower than the houses of the Muslims. Uh, they were not able to carry the jambiya, the um, you know, the, the knife that all men, as a sign of uh, of status and respect, would carry. They were not allowed to do that. They were not allowed to own properties. They were not allowed to ride on a horse or own a horse. They were they if they. Uh, had an animal, it could have been a donkey, and they had to, they had to ride it sideways and not, you know, in in, in the way that someone would ride um, an animal. Um, for my family, um, there was a specific um, decree by the imam that um, um, that touched them, and I'll, I'll share that story if we have the, 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 the time to do that. But there was the orphan decree. Any Jewish child that lost their parents, which was very common at that time uh, for mothers to die at childbirth, every orphan that lost their parents um, would be uh, automatically be taken by the uh, Muslim authorities and be raised as a Muslim, which was uh, something horrific for the Jewish community just to have their children be taken like that. So it was very common to smuggle the orphan kids to someplace else. Um, to ensure that they will be raised as Jews. So this is a story w about my uncle, my father's older brother. His name was Shalom II, and this is why my older brother was called Shalom II. 
So Shalom's wife um, died in childbirth, leaving three young children under the age of, I believe, four. Uh, and when my uncle Shalom died, um, my family knew that they have to take care of the children. But they also knew that the local authority knew who the people are, so they knew that they are orphans. So they had my, fa- my father and his mother, my father and my grandmother, had to walk for days um, to a distant Yemenite Jewish village so they can smuggle those children and disperse them into different other families so the other families are going to raise them. And in, th- in that village, they, they, those three children would not be known as, as orphans. And my father had to accompany my grandmother because as a woman, uh, she was not able to be walking by herself uh, in Yemen, every woman had to be accompanied by a male. So even though he was her son, uh, he would be the man next to her. Now, being Jews also, uh, and again, everybody would have known that they are Jews because um, they had to wear certain clothing that would identify them as Jews. Um, they they would hide during the daylight and um, just have to walk at nights for days. So that's something that my father often would share, my grandmother would share with us. Those three children um, grew up, and then they ended up being brought to the state of Israel in 1949. And growing up, you know, I would hear the stories from them as well, even though they were little children, the little bit that they were able to remember in those few years when they were raised in, uh, you know, a much farther a remote Yemenite village until they were reunited with their family in Israel. So that was the orphan decree. Um, so um, they were citizens of Yemen. They were second-rate citizens. They were under the protection of the government. But that did not mean that they had equal rights or or um, had an equal opportunity in anything. Um, again and again, there are always stories of intimidation um, and of um, persecution. And this is just stories that I am sharing uh, from my family. Uh, there are many more incidents and situations that happened uh, in the history of Yemeni Jews. Um, but, you know, that's a whole other story. I don't know if you want to spend more time about about that. We might be able to come back to that. Uh, so growing up in Yemen and having getting being married and ha- having children, was there a synagogue? near them? No. um, They were a place of worship, but, you know, I think that the word synagogue was not like that. I mean, they were among other Jews, so they were in their own little location. Um, The the concept of synagogue um, is, is very, you know, very modern, if you will. What they had is, yes, they had their own little place of worship, um, they had their own prayers. The, the Yemenite traditions of prayers are very different from what most most people know or think that they know about American Jewry. Uh, you know, if I, I think that I'm, uh, you know, that the people who are listening to us are basically Americans. Who, if they know anyone who's Jewish, then they can think about American Jews. It is completely different. The pronunciation, the Hebrew is different. Um, the the, the um, um, the format of the prayer is very similar. It's still the same ancient prayers, but there are a lot of other uh, different uh, rituals and, and traditions for the Yemenite Jews. So um, the, the Yemenite Jewry is considered one of the oldest mm. and most, if I, if, if I can use the word pure, uh, the most authentic, the most pure Jewish as can be. According to our tradition, um, Yemen, uh, the Yemenite Jews ended up in that region uh, after the the visit of Queen Sheba um, uh, in Jerusalem, visiting King uh, Solomon. And when she left, he sent with her some of the local uh, people that were with him, you know, the Judean people. I'll, I'll use the word Judean people because Jerusalem, I mean, King Solomon was in Jerusalem, Jerusalem in Judea. Um, so Judea... Um, the Judean people followed and accompanied uh, Queen Sheba. And Queen Sheba at that time, uh, rule was in that region, which was Ethiopia uh, of of today and Yemen of today. So this is the histories that have 
um, passed from generation to generation in my tradition. So the articulation of the Hebrew, the tradition of how to read the sacred text, the Torah, the traditions of the prayers uh, are just as they were thousands of years ago. So this is why the Yemenite pronunciation and the Yemenite traditions are considered uh, the most authentic. Also, being in Yemen, uh, the villages were very remote. There wasn't a lot of communication and relationship with the Jewish world outside of Yemen. So the tradition were not uh, diluted or, or affected um, by any of newer traditions or by intermarried or by any other new ideas that came from Europe or any of the other um, countries, even Jewish ideas, uh, they were not uh, as part of the Jewish world in Yemen because they were so remote and there wasn't as much communication and collaboration and transfer of, uh, of knowledge and, and teaching in that way. Um, in fact, one of the, uh, maybe your audience will, will connect with that, uh, you know that a man, in, in, in the Bible, a man would marry more than one woman. Um, and that was very common. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, everybody. It, it just was the way of life. And it's still like that in, in many of the Arab countries. Well, Yemenite Jews often had more than one woman. And my uncle, who came f to Israel in 1949, he was one of those individuals who came with two wives. So that was something that in Yemen they, they were able to do, where it is unheard in European Jewry. Yeah. Nobody was marrying more than one woman, and that also reflects the the um, you know the the um, influence that living among the Arabs had on the Jews in Yemen. Um, just like European Jews, when you live in a different country, you cannot be completely isolated. There is always give and take with the population, uh, with the traditions, with the religion. So Judaism was very much affected and, and sometimes uh, reactionary to Christianity in, uh, in European countries. And in Yemen, it was very similar with, with the Muslim world. Uh, my family spoke Yemenite, which is a dialect of Arabic, or, or an, Ara you know, an Arabic, basically. In, at my home, when I was growing up, we were talking Yemenite, again, a dialect of Arabic. Not, not Hebrew. Um, uh, Hebrew, too. It was very much like you would, you know, the language of the country, Hebrew, but my mom felt more comfortable in Yemen. As she got older, she spoke, uh, you know, half and half. Um, but their, their daily language with my grandparents was um, in Yemen. They were pro prolific in their uh, understanding and, and um, mastery of the Hebrew, but they used it only in a more um, holy uh, circumstances, mm -hmm. in, in ritual, um, in prayer, in reading the Torah. But when you go to the market, when you communicate with your kid, go get the milk, they would say that in, in Yemenite and not in the Hebrew. Um, my, my mom had a lot of, uh, um, you know, Yemeni friends, uh, Muslim friends. So even though, um, I, as I mentioned before, they were, they were Hemis, they were second-rate citizens, and that was the policy of uh, of the ruling and, and of the ruling sheikh or the ruling authority of that locality and the the policy of the state. But on the one on one, they had a lot of relationship and give and take and, and rapport with the local community, the local Yemeni community, um, very much like it would be in Israel right now between Jews and Arabs, like it would be here in the states between different people of different ethnic background. Um, so. Um, one, the, the fact that they were second-rate citizens did not mean that they, and, and that they were isolated in a certain way, did not mean that they did not have any contact with, uh, you know, with the local Muslim Yemeni people. Some of them were good, some of them were not good. It's just a, um, just a way how anybody would be. You have good right. people and you have bad people. What stories did your parents tell you about the uh, airlift that happened that brought them to Israel? So, um, my parents um, have heard that um, the Messianic times had arrived and that the Jews are all gathering in the state of Israel. It was always time of increasing hostilities towards the Jews, and they felt, like many other Jews, that it's time to leave. And 
if it is indeed a messianic time, maybe we should go and, and, and go to the land of Israel. So they left their little village, and uh, for quite a few days they walked all the way to San. My, my mother was with my father, so usually the women would join the men's, um, the men's family. So my mother joined my father's family, and in one of those uh, one of those nights, they were attacked by Fadayin, which are like nomads, group of people, um, like very much like a desert um, um, robbers. Arabs, Arabs robbers. but maybe not Muslims, or they were no, Muslims as well. Definitely Muslims, yeah. yes. Uh, just you know, robbers, and, uh, and, and they took everything that they had with them. It's not like they were able to carry anything. They were walking by foot, but everything that they had uh, was taken from them. Mm. Um, so when they arrived in Tusana, the, the capital of Yemen, they, really, they arrived with nothing. And my mom always told me that uh, when she and her mother-in-law uh, went to the bathhouse, and, you know, I don't know if you know, but in the Arab um, traditions there is... Uh, public bathhouse in, in the main cities, and when they went to the uh, public bathhouse, uh, somebody stole their clothing. Mm. <laughs> so, so they had uh, some some good person. They don't know even they didn't know who it was, but some good soul gave them some clothing. So my mother uh, would joke that when she um, got into the land of Israel. It wasn't even her own clothing. She came with absolutely nothing. Nothing. With absolutely nothing. Uh, from Yemen, they, they were drove, dro- uh, driven in um, uh, big trucks into Aden. Aden is a port city by the Red Sea. And when they arrived there, they stayed in uh, a camp. Um, that th- The name of the camp is Hashed. And in Hashed, they stayed for just a few days. Uh, other Jews stayed there in that camp for much longer times. My parents were just lucky. They, they just ended them ended up there uh, for a few days, and then they were airlifted. So what were they thinking? They really thought it was a, um, um, the um, prophecy, the, the materialization of the prophecy, the, the prophecy coming true, um, that God will be lifting all Jews on the wings of eagles into the land of Israel. Mm. So they, they've never seen airplane they did not know what it is so for them the roaring sound of of the airplane was indeed like the roaring sound of the heavenly wings carrying them into into the holy land into the land of their ancestors and back uh, into the land where they came from some 3000 years ago where they originated from it probably had had to be i'm guessing one of the most powerful moments of their lives if not the most powerful yes absolutely absolutely all right, so you yes. were not born in Yemen. No, I was born As in As the Israel. baby, you were born in Israel. Yes. Uh, being born in Israel, being raised in Israel, uh, what does that mean to you? And then what, what was that experience growing up in Israel? I, I don't even know how to start and answer that question. Um, it's where I belong. It's my home. Um I did not think anything about it growing up in Israel because I did not know anything different than that. I knew of my parents' stories, and I knew of how privileged and blessed we are to be back in our homeland. Um, as I said before, in, you know, my father would say, we've been longing for this day for 3,000 years, and here we are back in the country of where we came from. Um, but as a child, I don't think I thought anything different because that's the only thing I've known about. Um, I I I lived um, um, I lived the the, the the Zionist idea, um, embraced the Zionist idea that we as the Jewish people have the right to reclaim again our ancestral land that we are uh, the indigenous people of this land and we came to the land that God had given us. Um, I s- had a wonderful childhood. I. Um, I grew up uh, in a small village. It's a, it's a moshav. Moshav is an agricultural setting where everybody owns their own land. However, all the, hum- the houses are centered together. That is more for security purposes, um, uh, where the land is outside of that kind of a circle of uh, clustered of homes that is together. Um, I... I did not realize that I was living through wars because everybody were around like that. 
I, I remember 1967 as a, you know, I... I you know, as a toddler, I just have a very vague memory. I just remember the airplanes above me, and I remember trying to run into the bomb shelter, knowing that I have to be there and I have to be there very quickly. And I, um, and then I remember, like somebody lifting me and and mm-hmm. running with me. That's about the only thing I remember from that. I was very, very, very young, just a toddler. And uh, I have a very vivid memories from 1973, the Yom Kippur War that I remember very well. Um, and then I have a lot of uh, uh, memories through different um, hostilities, the Intifadas, uh, 1982, the first Lebanon War, uh, because at that time I was serving in the military. Um, and one of my best friends, I mean, we would, one of my best friends from high school was killed in that war. Mm. His name was Pinchas. Um, so, but growing up in Israel, you just accept it because you don't know any better. You don't know that you are constantly living under um, a state of fear and terror. Uh, and at the same time, life continues. There is joy. There is, uh, I guess, the experiences of any person growing up, first love, and, you know, just all the things that everybody's yeah. going through. Um, I was very proud to serve in the Israeli military. I was very proud um, when I completed uh, with distinguished uh, my, my um, uh, officer course, and I was an officer in the Israeli military. Um, so it was like everybody else that lived, you know, struggle and, and made, made it through and just lived life to the fullest and do the best we can. Uh, I think that only when I came here to the States, I realized the difficulty that the life we had um, I, I remember I remember one thing. The first week I was here, and at that time, I was already married. My husband is an American. And, um, and I heard a siren, and I immediately opened the windows to try to see where the airplanes are coming, mm. like which direction they're going. And I called him, and I said, what's going on? I mean, where is the, where is the, <laughs> where is the bomb Ameri- shelter? You were yes, looking here. for American yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And, you know. Uh, just outside of Chicago, here in, the, in Illinois. And um, and I asked him, where's the bomb shelter? And I said, there the siren is going. And he said, oh, this is just a tornado. <laughs> the tornado siren. <laughs> they, they could be scary as well. <laughs> yes. But, uh... <laughs> and then and then I, I was walking around, and everybody leaves their garbage outside. And my immediate, my immediate thought was, uh, it could be a bomb. There could be a bomb. So mm. I immediately was recording, where is there a bag or, you know, kind of a big bag or a little container of something outside, and I will cross the street in case it is a bomb. And then I realized it, people just leave the garbage outside. It's just trash. It's yeah. just trash. I mean, yeah. like, you know, things like that. Or uh, constantly going to buildings and immediately looking for the exit sign because if the building is blowing up or you hear shooting, you need to find out where the exit. So... And, and I wasn't even thinking twice about it. This is just how you grow up at school. You under, you see a package that is unintended. You immediately call security because there, it could be a bomb. So, so it's a form of PTSD. I wouldn't even th- think about it like that. I would just think about it as this is just how you live your life. But is it so? Yeah, because you're constantly on alert. You're constantly, constantly looking around you and saying, am I safe here? Are am you, I safe here? Are you like that now? You know, unfortunately, yes. Mm, wow. And I would say here right now, literally just in the last few months. Uh, I, I, just in the last yeah, few months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just in the last few months. We're going to talk about the last few months in a moment. Uh, what part of Israel? Was it southern, central, northern? Uh, my Moshav was really in the center of Israel, but right on the 67 border. Okay. Uh, and my Moshav was surrounded by Arab villages. And for many, many years, we had a very peaceful relationship with that. Um, my, the, the border was so close um, that um, um, after Israel, um, after the war, we were playing in the trenches of the border, what, where the border used to be. Uh, I remember, you know, we, um, as children, we used to play cowboy and Indians in the trenches. That's how close it was. I remember as a child, bullet holes on, on, the, on the walls, on the outside walls of our homes. Um, and um, this is how close it was. 
um, and and um, I, I mentioned that the Moshav is an agricultural setting, uh, and at that time there were no fear. You know, there was such a um, at least the way I saw it or I felt it a very uh, cordial and, and peaceful relationship. My father had a partner uh, that helped him in the in the fields. So my father with, with my five brothers and the partner with their children all, all worked in the fields. They were Arabs mm. from from the next door village and it was wonderful relationship and the wife of the person Hassan his name was Hassan the wife of Hassan who worked with my father would sit for hours with my mom and they would you know like would would talk about whatever because my mom spoke Arabic that was how they how they articul how they're spoken and 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 she was her friend they were friends um i had a friend from the same arab village there was a bus that would come to the Moshav through that Arab village. The name of the Arab village is Jaljulia. So the bus would come through Jaljulia to our Moshav. We'll pick up the people, the workers, and, and as, as it would go to the big city, and it, it's not that big of a city, but for us from a small village, it was the big city. Uh, it would go again the same way it came through the Arab village. And when I was in high school, I was in, uh, um, in the big city, in Petah Tikva. And in one of my best friends were a kid from from uh, from Georgia. His name was Adnan. We would sit together. We would we were best friends. And we would go to school together. We would drive back. We would sit together in the bus, and we were we we were such good friends that I remember my parents giving me the conversation, and then he shared that his parents gave him the conversation that it doesn't matter how much the fish and the bird love each other. The fish cannot live outside of the water, and the bird cannot live in the water. So um, they were wonderful relationship. I even remember walking through. If, if we missed the bus, we would hitchhike uh, to the Arab village and walk through the Arab village into the, into the Moshav. Um, I remember as a child, when it was the Sabbath day, my fam- I, I did not mention that, but my Moshav, my family is very orthodox. So, you know, on the Sabbath day, you're not allowed to have um, to watch TV. You know, it's it's a holy day. It's a special day, and we as kids, we will you know sneak out of the homes, and a bunch of us will go to the Arab village and have popsicles <laughs> during Shabbat because we could get it over there. Right. And we were kids. We were you know fourteen, fifteen, sixteen boys and girls, Jewish boys and girls. I never felt threatened. I I was never afraid. Uh, and coming from Yemenite background, we all spoke Arabic. We, we were able to communicate with them. Um, and it was very um, disappointing that, you know, later things had changed. But that was, you know, the early childhood that I remember. Yeah, what, what I've found studying history across, uh, and I'm not a historian, I, I happen to just in, in, enjoy and, and love learning from history. At the individual human level, there's very rarely long-lasting problems. It's only when you uh, elevate to powers of mm-hmm. authority mm-hmm. that where the the just the silliness happens. The abs- silliness is not a strong enough word, but you get my point. Yeah. All right. So, so when you were in school, whether it was when you were eight or fifteen, when you weren't in school, you weren't helping around the house or, or doing what your parents needed you to do. Were you just with your friends playing? Uh, in the Arab village or, or playing near where you grew up? What, what was your thing? What, 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 when everybody thought of you, what were, were they? Oh, yes. She's... Uh, um, um, they used to call me Tola'at Sfarim, a bookworm. Mm. I loved reading books. I loved reading books. I loved nature. I used to have a backpack and get some water, get some stuff with me. I used to have books about... Uh, birds and um, and flowers, and I would go to the hills. And again, it was just me. I was like again nine, ten, eleven, twelve, a little girl, walking for hours. Um, this is how safe we felt. And I was all over the the hills. It was the Judean hills. I mean, now people would call it whatever they would call it, but it was the place I grew up. And um, I would love to collect bugs, <laughs> bugs, <laughs> yes, bugs and and uh, thorns and flowers and, you know, compare that and see if I can find their names. And 
so I, I loved nature. I loved feeling free. I loved being outside. I, I, I would hike in those, um, in the hills. Uh, every time, every once in a while, you know, my mom would be upset, like, where were you and why are you alone? And every once in a while, it, it, it wouldn't be just me. I would have with other friends coming with me. But uh, that was my favorite time. Uh, and then I, I, you know, I was a kid. I played like everybody else. I also remember um, quite few times that I would insist on the other kids to sit down and I'll be their teacher, you know, <laughs> and have to you like to play teacher. To do that, yes. Um, as a teenager, oh, we love to dance. You know, we mm. would have uh, we would have just parties and dance, and uh, um, you know, just uh, just be kids yeah, yeah. and have fun. So most of your childhood, Michael we, Jackson. We love Michael Jackson. He's maybe uh, one of the ten most musically gifted people to ever live on earth. We used to yeah. sing that. We didn't know what we were singing, but we used to think that we sing English. <laughs> you know, I remember beat it. Sure. You yeah. would say, beat it, beat it, beat it, because that's what it sounded yeah, to that's us. that's exactly what it sounded like. But it was fun, you know. It was, uh, from my mushav, it was a very close-knit um, f- um, family. Um, um, it's it's the beauty when you grow up in a very small uh, community. Everybody knows and you know everybody. It's also not so good because everybody knows everything about you. Right. Um, but it, it, it was a wonderful Childhood, I, I, I always felt safe and loved and sense of belonging. And I think those are the, the main three things that every child needs, to feel that they are safe, to feel that they are loved, and they belong somewhere. I knew that people are going to have my back. I knew that um, I, I belong to a place, and everybody is like me. Everybody else were Yemenite there. We were all coming from the same place. We were so poor, but none. But we were all poor, so none of us knew that we are poor. Um, I did not have TV in my house until I was twelve, and we mm. didn't had um, a phone in our in, in our home until I think I was in the military around eighteen or so. Uh, when I I still have memories of childhood where the bathroom was outside. It's it's very interesting when I share this ki- these kind of memories. I often tell the people that I speak with that I lived probably in the same way that their grandparents had lived here in the U.S., you know, like when they when they were up north in North Dakota and they were struggling with the weather and they have only one building and they had to build uh, uh, their farm, like where my husband's family is. Now they're living in, in uh, Wisconsin. So um, definitely not a life of privilege from a material materialistic point of view, but very much privilege with a sense of, as I said, safety, love, and belonging. Yeah, that's a great way to think about uh, anybody's childhood. Did they yeah. have those three uh, mm-hmm. in, a, in a good place? And if they did, they had a, yeah. a, a nice childhood, regardless of uh, material things. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how, how old were you when you realized that you were going to have to serve in the IDF? Zero. Everybody uh, is Israeli. You, Every, you, know, you know, I mean, my goodness, you grow up knowing that that's what you're going to do. Um, just like you're going to go to school. Um, you're going to serve in the military. I mean, all my brothers served in the military. Uh, one older sister that insisted, like me, to serve in the military. One sister did not serve in the military. But everybody around me served in the military. It was a duty. So technically you didn't have to join the military? Or? No, no, no. I, I, um, as, as, a, um, as an Orthodox uh, woman, I could have asked for an exemption. Uh-huh. And as an exemption... Uh, I would have done more of a national service. Uh, what's the English name? There is like a, a Peace Corps, Peace Corps kind of service. But, that but I would focused have on done. Israel. Yeah, 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 and, and social only services. in its yeah, something and yeah. and do something, uh, but not serve in the military as as a full pledged soldier girl. Um, but I insisted and I wanted to do that. But every uh, um, teenager, every seventeen, eighteen year old, has to serve in the military in Israel. Uh, my children have a dual citizenship. My oldest um, chose not to serve in the military. He's pacifist, and he decided that he does not want to do anything that has to do with guns. So you have a Marine son and a pacifist son. Well, I have four boys. Okay. So my oldest did not do anything. My second son was a U.S. Marine with two tours. He was in Afghanistan um, and um, a cool guy. 
I love I love all of them. They're all cool. But he he served in the uh, as a U.S. Marine. Uh, my number three son served in the IDF, Israeli Defense Forces, mm-hmm. and he was a lone soldier, and he did wonderful stuff over there. My youngest um, uh, was also served in the IDF, and uh, he's serving right now as we speak. Oh, he's wow. in Israel serving right now. Uh, both my young, my younger boys were uh, lone soldiers in the Israeli Defense Forces. When you say lone soldier, tell me more. That means that they are there without immediate family. Ah. They don't have mother and I mean, they have cousins, they have aunts, or but nobody's there to take care of them. In Israel, when somebody serves in the military, when they go home, they go home. They literally go home. Um, like you drive. 30 minutes and you're home from your base. You, I mean, the farthest you drive three, four hours and you're home. Uh, my children did not have a home there. Of course, they can go to their, you know, uncles and aunts, but... It's still not mom and it's dad. Not, it's yeah, exactly. Yeah. So they are lone soldiers. They are alone there. Um, I think that people also don't realize that Israel is so small when you are serving. You know, let me say, when my son was in Afghanistan, I mean, you have thousands of miles away right? He's so far away. When my children serve in the Israeli military and have to deal with the enemy, that is 50 miles away. That is a two-hour drive, and okay. you are at the border, you know, whether it's the north or south. Uh, so it's a whole different concept. I mean, you, you know, one hour you're fighting, and then in two or three hours you're home with your children or with your wife or with your parents. It's a whole different mindset. Yeah. Um, I can't even fathom that. Yeah, that's hard to think about. All right, so when you joined the IDF, did you have any uh, opportunity to select what you were going to do, or they just said, Here, here's what you're going to go do? Um, there, is, there is aptitude tests, and, and you know, it, it has been quite some time since I was in the military, but it still works in the same system, more or less, uh, as in their aptitude tests, their physical tests, aptitude tests, psychological tests, um, to, to figure out what you are most capable um, and and where will you fit? And so that's number one. But there's also the, the, the needs of the Army. And then you're going to be placed in uh, hopefully what you are most suited to do but and, and what, the, what the military needs to do. So I did the same test like everybody else did. Um, I had the most unmilitary military service because I was a teacher. Mm-hmm. I ended up in a teaching unit, and um, uh, in that unit, there were different kind of teachers. There were the teachers who actually had a degree, so they joined the military after their uh, university, um, after they obtained a, a university degree and taught whatever they whatever they had a degree in. And then there were others like me that worked with a different population. I worked with the uh, at risk population, with teenagers that. Um, um, you know, that dealt with prostitution, with drugs, with uh, crimes. My my service um, was to to try to bring them back into the fold, bring them back into school, bring them back into mainstream uh, society, with the understanding and, and again with the hope that they will later serve in the military. So I did not work. I did not do anything combat-related in any way, um, but that was always my passion anyway. I, w- right. I just told you, you pl- that you I was, yes, I was yeah. playing teacher. So, um, and then um, in the second year of my service, I went to an officer course, and then when I came back uh, to serve, I, I actually came back to the same unit, but this time I was as an officer. I was the liaison between the military and the Ministry of Education. Mm. Uh, many of our soldier girls as teachers would place in schools that um, in in non, you know in undesirable areas uh, again either with crime or either undeveloped cities or, or um, um, places in Israel that uh, teachers would not want to go or were not paid well enough to go or to to be so you know, being a soldier, you are going where you you go where you need to go, and you don't have a choice. Uh, so, with this collaboration, the Ministry of Education will just tell the military, "Well, we need such and such teachers at such and such place, and we will just provide them." So, I was doing a lot of, uh, uh, 
you know, um, as I said, liaison between between the Ministry of Education and the military. And I was also uh, in charge of those soldier girls. If there are any issues with f- any issues at work, um, because as a, as a soldier girl, you can't say, "Well, I don't like it. I'm quitting," because they can't quit. Uh, also, as soldier girls, often a, um, a principal of a school can demand more than they what they could do or should do. Uh, you know, in a scope of hours and work, and I would be there to, uh, um, you know, fend for for the for the soldier girl who is a teacher in that in that uh, um, institution. So you were their commander. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, the liaison with the absolutely. Ministry of Education. I, I, in fact, I had, uh, but which you know, I had about three hundred girls under my command, and when you are, you know, nineteen and twenty. It feels good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I get it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, but again, it's life. You don't. You don't. It feels good, and it it causes you to grow up. It it um, you, you have to become mature. You have to know who you are. You have to know how to deal with people. Uh, you have to develop skills, um, um, people skills, organizational skills. And you have to know who you are and the strength of your conviction of why you're doing and, and wh- why you're doing what you're doing, what you stands for, in order to articulate that to people that are under you, that are your subordinates. And um, um, you know, so I think this is one of the uh, um, great things in Israel society, where all Israeli kids have to serve in the military um, before they even go and start their university. Uh, it, it it still amazes me when when we th- when we send eighteen and nineteen year old kids to university and spend thousands of dollars for kids that are not even mature. They have no idea who they are and what they want to do, and um, and think that that's okay. In, in it's our, usually not. In our household, um, serving your country was on the table, and before you even think about going to school, and you know, and all my children have college degree but first you take care of your country you serve your country you give back you do something worthwhile um so i'm not there to tell people not to go to college but i am definitely there to tell everybody you should do something to serve your own country and think about the greater good not just what is good for you and it's okay to take a year off go to work and you know hopefully pay for your own education not expect your parents to pay for it uh, you need to own it. You need to. Uh, You're an adult now, yeah. after all. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. So you look back fondly on your service. It, it, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. That's uh, that's a powerful way to to, uh, to grow up, and as a young woman, uh, to, how you spend your first couple of years that's pretty powerful, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. really powerful for you and your family. It's yeah. It's responsibility, independence, accountability, yeah. uh, staying strong. Uh, overcoming difficulty and challenges. It's, it, I'm not saying that it was easy. There were a lot of difficult times, but this is how you grow. What brought you to America? Mm. Everybody asks me that. A tall, handsome <laughs> U.S. Marine. <laughs> That's who, what brought me to America. Who served in Israel. Who served in Israel. He was a U.S. Marine. Um, protecting the U.S. Embassy in Tel Aviv, the U.S. Embassy and the Ambassador of Tel Aviv. Yeah, we put our best-looking Marines at embassies. Always, <laughs> always. The love of my life and so still is. how long had you been seeing each other before you realized you were going to come to America? Um, for two years. He, he was there for over two years. Okay. But he, he was there for two years, and... Um, um, and the first few months, we knew each other, but uh, as an officer, I wasn't allowed to have any relations with a foreign uh, military. So we, we've met, we knew each other. We even had one date, but we didn't tell anyone because I did not want to get in trouble. When I got out of the military, though, then I was able to see him and have, you know, relationship on open, in, in the open. Right, right. Um, so were you married in Israel? Or were you- Yes, married both. I mean, of course, we did it here because we needed. I, I needed to get my um, uh, papers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To be, but not. You didn't become an American citizen right away. I did no, not not right away. Not right away. It took me quite some time. Um, 
I, I, as I said before, I was, I was, and am very proud Israeli citizen. I did not want to. I, I was fine without that. Um, and I think that there were two reasons when I decided to become an a, a American citizen. Number one is politics, because I thought if if I am part of this country and I want things to be in a certain way, I should voice my opinion, and the way to do it is by voting. Uh, so that was number one. But uh, there was a more of a visceral uh, reason. It was one of the times that I came from Israel. I had children at that time, only three at that time. And they separated me because I, I did not have an American passport, but my children did. So I Just was, traveling, they separated yeah, you. Yeah, when I came back to the States, mm-hmm. uh, the, the um, um, immigration or, or, you know, to come in. Because your, your kids were citizens. Yes. But you were not. But I wasn't. Yeah. And, the, and I was like, no, that's not okay. Um, and that's when I decided to become American citizen, which I was proud to do it. You know, I, I kind of wanted to do it for the long time, but I haven't, you know, I don't know, it's just life. You just go through life and not doing something. So I, I did become an American. Um, and uh, as I said, I'm very, very proud of becoming an American. What year did you come over here for the first time? A uh, long time ago. <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. Long time ago. Well, you, you do have to tell the story of uh, the day you celebrated becoming a citizen. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, I, became, I became an American in October 31st of 2000. And, um, and I tr- you know, again, I, 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 I said it four times by now. I was so happy. I remember I, I had tears on, on that morning when I... I had to swear in. I studied for that test for so long. I don't even know if I would be able to pass it right now. Yeah, but I, pro- I, I probably couldn't I pass studied it. for it, and I couldn't just wait to be there. And I remember standing there and, and doing the, you know, the Pledge of Allegiance. And, um, and I wanted to celebrate. I invited my whole congregation. I literally invited 150 families into... Not, uh, not people, families. Families, yes. And I said, everybody can come. The whole neighborhood. I had flyers in the whole neighborhood. Um, my community, and um, I, um, this is I Iowa ordered in time. Iowa, yeah, yeah. Bettendorf, in Bettendorf, Iowa. And, um, uh, and I ordered 50 pies. I had to have a special, I, I ordered 50 pies and ice cream, because what can be more American that, you not, know? Not much, yeah. <laughs> apple pies and ice cream. And I invited everybody for apple pies and ice cream. I invited everyone. I invited the judge that sworn me. I invited the um, representatives. I invited the senators. I invited uh, the the mayor of Bettendorf. I invited uh, the governor. And I invited the president of the United States <laughs> at, at that time, which was Clinton. Right. Um, and um, I even have the invitation someplace at home. Um, so, and we told our boys, you know, that we invited everyone and, you know, just wanted to get excited. We told them that we invited even the president. Um, and again, but so you actually did invite the we president. We did. We did. Yeah. 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 We he, sent, rece- he received an yes, invitation. Yes. We sent, we sent an invitation. Um, um, so, um, so on that day, the whole house, everything around inside, outside with big, um, um, microphone things, you know, proud to be an American, you know, all those songs, <laughs> as loud as can be. We had like a big open house oh, from three it. to six, you know, as loud as can be, and all the decorations, you know, red, white, and blue. And all the other homes are decorated with Halloween because ah. it was Halloween, right? Um, so, and at some point, so again, we were telling the boys and everybody were coming, and at some point we had a helicopter hovering above for whatever reason. And um, our my number two, Ariel, was running around. Th- I mean, he was literally around in the yard shouting and saying, the president is coming, <laughs> the president is coming, thinking that, the, you know, the helicopter is bringing, um, you know, Clinton to our home. And shall I tell what I told you? If you'd okay, like, so. it's, that's entirely up to you. <laughs> <laughs> so I always say that Clinton could have come, but he was busy with another Jewish girl, and that's the only reason why he didn't make it. Um, but it was a it was a beautiful, beautiful day, beautiful day. And then after that, we all went trick or treating. I mean, I can see the joy in your eye now. Thinking back, you thinking back to that day, I imagine the day of was just a, an amazing day for you and your family. It, it, it was, it was, and um, 
again, this is, this is a great country, and I am thankful for this great country to receiving us uh, and treating the Jews in such a, such a wonderful way. I, I uh, you know, the Jewish community here is the most prosperous uh, of all in, in the world, and uh, we are here because of what this country stands for, for the equality and the freedom and the opportunity that we have here. And um, as I said, my husband served this country, as was his brother, as was his uncle, and the rest of his family, and um, as was my son. And as I would encourage every citizen to serve their country, um, again, I opened with, we have a lot of problems. Sure, of course, every country has a lot of problems, but there are still more good in this place than bad. And if we hold on to good, and if we come together, um, there is such a promise to this country. We just need um, we just need to be um, to be um, active partners of what's going on, and everybody should go and vote. I mean, next year is it what November we're going to have? Uh, yeah, elections? Big, big election in November. Yeah, uh, yeah. At, at roughly half of the citizens, the adults who can vote, who can legally vote in this country, don't vote typically, and that's. It's ridiculous. It's atrocious, actually. Uh, but I will I will be voting uh, as it is my civic duty to vote. Uh, so October seventh was an unbelievably horrible day. I remember where I was, um, and I'm I'm not Jewish. Um, I, it could just be another news uh, event, sort of thing, and then sort of fade. The good news is uh, the world is still looking at Israel for for a lot of reasons. Um, but that attention, I, I think, is, I would classify it as mostly good, but I, I, I don't know how to think about that. Let me start with where were you when you found out about uh, the events of October 7th? I was home. It was Shabbat, Saturday Shabbat. I was just getting, uh, I, I, I was, I think I was woken up by my alarm clock. And as I looked at my alarm, I saw all the feed of uh, texts and messages coming in. And I looked at it, and the first thing, I, I called Leo, my husband, and I said, there's a war, there is a war. And I got up, uh, that's, that's where I was, and then, of course, I came here because there were services. Uh, and we had a lot of people here. And um, it was also the holiday of Simchat Torah on, on that night. Uh, and we were supposed to have a huge party here for the holiday, celebrating the holiday. We had food that was cooked the day before. Mm. We were going to have... I can't remember the, the number of registration, over 70 people, between 70 and 100 people coming, and food, uh, and, and celebration, and the dancing with the Torah. Um, and um, I, I called our leadership, and I said, there is a war. We are not going to be doing any celebration. And instead, we are going to call a prayer vigil. So we immediately sent out emails and text and communication with our congregation. At that time, I was already in communication uh, with the Jewish Federation here. Everybody were trying to, to figure out what's going on. During all that time, I was constantly receiving phone calls and texts uh, from my children and my sisters and family in Israel. Now, on Shabbat, uh, we usually don't use phone. It, it, it is a sacred day where you kind of put the... Uh, um, you know the mundane things of life um, aside. So it's a, whole, it's a holy day. Yeah, ordinarily I would not be using my phone. I would not be turning TV on. You just concentrate on God. Holy day, right? In, being close to God and, and trying to be um, in in the right mindset. So of of again holiness and closeness to God, relationship with God, prayer to God, praises of God, um, but. With the situation that it was, of course, I, w I needed to know what's going on. So, um, and I remember, I remember at that time something I did not um, express with my community here, but it was a sheer panic, mm. the sheer panic uh, because uh, of what I was hearing from home, from my sisters, from my children, of the atrocities of the uh, the unimaginable scale of what was going what was going on live, I was hearing live 
where people from all of those kibbutzim and, uh, and, and uh, moshavim in places uh, by the Gaza border, I mean, people were there for hours. I don't know if you know about it or those who are hearing us, that some of them were in, in their safe spaces in their home. Obviously, it wasn't as, as safe as it should have been for hours. And you have people there asking for help. Um, so it was the sheer panic and, and um, terror for what was unfolding live at that time that, um, that was just horrific, absolutely horrific. So that's what I remember. Yeah, and because I, it was, I will it, always remember. I will always remember. Everybody here would remember. And um, as you were talking to your sisters or your your sons who were there, it, those events were unfolding. Absolutely, yeah. And and you know nowadays, I mean, it it wasn't even us saying; it was the Hamas people broadcasting, mm -hmm. putting the videos on YouTube as they were killing people, as they were beheading people, as they were raping people. At the act, they were sending those. You just needed to go to YouTube and, and see what they were posting with, with, with glee and pride. The, by, I, you tell me, it, it seems uh, like it's by far the worst day in the history of the state of Israel since 1949. Absolutely. That would I, uh, absolutely. I would agree with that. So, I would agree with that. Um, uh, there, there had been... No day like that uh, in absolutely in the history of the state of Israel, and I would say since the since there were no other days since the Holocaust where twelve hundred people die in the course of fifteen to twenty four hours yeah. and when we are talking about twelve hundred uh, uh, um, there are about seven Eight million Jews in Israel, right? So one thousand two hundred. If you will think about the scale, let's say let's say that there are ten million Jews in Israel. There are ten million citizens, again roughly, right. in, in the state of Israel. About eight million of them are Jews, and two million are Arabs. Uh, but let's say for the sake of argument that there are ten million, right? So there, for the ratio. So uh, if there are ten million. Um, Israelis, how many millions are um, citizens of the U.S. or live in the U.S.? 300 uh, and what, 53? 360. 360. Yeah. So let's say it's, it's a ratio of 36, right? So it would be as if the United States of America had lost 36 times 1,200. Let's say about 40,000. Just 36,000. America's never had a day like that. 36 thousands nothing nothing close in 20, 24 hours it's it's hard to fathom and take and take and 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 they took 240 240 absolutely um um just citizens children i mean i mean everybody knows at at this point children 9 year old month baby what what they uh, women 80 year old women 84 year old women I mean, everybody, um, you just need to go and, and see those videos. And they are there. It wasn't They're even, still there. They're still there. And, and again, it is what they were posting, what they were posting, what they were taking, videos that they were taking. It was not from the Israeli lens or point of view or somebody from Israeli taking those videos. They were doing that. Who was taking all of those videos? They were doing it. And, and with 240 civilians, elderly, children, babies... Um, multiply that by 36 as well. It's thousands. What what would the U.S. would do with a situation like that? I saw one horrific video of this poor child, and I could think only about my child, be, two of them. I'll, I'll say about that kid. Um, I can't remember his name now, but he was about eight years old, and he was surrounded by those Hamas uh, and children. So that video was taken from Gaza, and those kids taunting him, you know, say, say, say mom in Hebrew, say this in Hebrew, say this in Hebrew. And with every word he wasn't saying or saying, they would smack him. Mm. So here's a little eight or nine year old kid. You could see the fear in his face. You can see the terror on, in his eyes. 
surrounded by adults and a bunch of kids just constantly smacking him right and left and on his head. And, I mean, who took that video? They were taking it from Gaza, who was participating. Some, and, and when I'm saying kids, they were kids about his age and maybe a couple years older than that. And then there was a little girl, a little girl, and she was surrounded by Gazans, Hamas or not Hamas, I do not know. And she was like three or four year old, beautiful black curls. Um, and they were talking about the Yehudi, uh, the, the, the Yehudi girl, the, the, the Jewish little girl. And they were saying, and they were, they were actually, I mean, with her, they were not hurting her, but they were amused. They were they were amused by her, and and she was you know the 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 camera was taken by an adult, so the the angle was her looking up to the camera, n- not knowing what's going on around her, and they were just laughing at her bewilderment and completely confused face, and and were trying to say some words in Hebrew, Ima, Abba, you know like Mom, Dad, and and she wasn't even crying; she was just like in shock um, and and it's it's stories like that 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 is unbelievable I mean and you know now now we have many of them that came back sharing the stories of their experiences there um, it is the most outrageous show of, of inhumanity and cruelty from all of those that perpetrated these these crimes it, it, it's disgusting. It's barbaric. It's every uh, word that you can think of. I, I, it's hard for me to fathom that human beings are treating other human beings like that. I just it, it doesn't make sense to me as an American. It doesn't make sense to me as a human being. Um, you know, I have a friend here uh, here in in Richmond. Um, he's, uh, uh, I'm not sure. Help you with the English uh, forensic. Mm-hmm. Um, that I mean, she's actually um, so. She, that's what she does. I, I won't say where she's from or what she does, um, but twice she was asked to come back to go to Israel. She's um, um, she lived in Israel for a few years, and she was asked twice to go back by by the uh, Ministry of Health and Hospitals. I don't know exactly which organization, uh, because there were so many bodies and so many remains. I won't even say bodies remains uh, that they didn't even know how, what to identify. It was just bags of ashes uh, with fragments of bones that were left. Um, and she was one of those few people, I don't know how she was able to do that, um, try to identify what she can identify from, from that. And, and um, um, there was... We, we would be in constant communication, but at some point, um, um, you know, I don't want to share too many personal things, but it's heartbreaking. It's, it's tearing you from the inside uh, when, when you see remains of babies burnt and, and people say it didn't happen. Um, um, it's, it's, there, there are no words. There are no words. I will say, I will say, I don't know if, if other Jews will agree with me or other people will agree with me, but I would say that some of those things we have seen are worse than, than the Holocaust. Because at the Holocaust, the Nazis were trying to hide it. Here, they were showing it. They were videoing. Videotaping it at the action, at the act, and doing it with joy and pride to show everybody else how it should be done. It's I mean, almost like they don't know it's wrong. But it's clear it's it's the highest level of wrong that there is. You know, I don't know if they don't know that it's wrong. Obviously, there is evil, and people are evil. Are you going to say that all evil people do not know that that is wrong? I would love to believe that. I really would love to believe that, that there is ignorance there. But I would love to believe that, but I don't. I, I really don't. I think that they knew what they were doing, and I think that they they did not think that that it is wrong to do that to the Jews because they intended to do it. Uh, I mean, it is very clear what is the agenda of the Hamas. I mean, it is 
they have it in writing. Yeah, they're telling the world. Yeah. There is no, I mean, they're even saying now, kill the Jews wherever they're at. This is why we have to have police every time we have any functions here in our synagogue. We have to have police coverage. And that's in every synagogue in the world, probably. They say it. They say it. And you're not going to believe that? They say it. Well, and they showed themselves uh, in October. Uh, Anti-Semitism is something that I haven't had to think about for most of my life. Uh, I've given it quite a bit of thought since October 7th, um, and, and I've given it some thought prior to that, but, but been uh, quite thoughtful about it the last few months. Uh, help me understand why anti-Semitism exists and then what we can do to eradicate it from the earth, because clearly it shouldn't exist. Um, I can give you a lecture of the history of anti-Semitism. I don't think that that's what you're asking me. I'm looking why, for a why, high level. Yeah, no. Why does it exist? Um, because there is evil in this world. And it's the nature of evil to, to hurt, demolish uh, what, whatever there is goodness in the world. Um, so from a specifically why is there anti-Semitism, you can find a lot of reasons um, at face value, right? Because some people say, well, Jews are prosperous uh, and Jews are rich, and they, you, have, you would have people who would say, therefore, they control the economy. You, I mean, you just need to hear all the propaganda of the far right and, you know, extremists, um, what they believe about the Jews. You, you can hear it all over. I don't want to repeat those because sure, I don't sure. want to give it any platform or space. You, have a, you, you hear a lot of those. They are, do, they are this, they are that, they are different, they are, you know. You can f- find a lot of reasons any person who will tell you they don't like it, you ask them why don't you like the Jew, they will come up with a reason. Uh, all of them are false. All of them are bogus. All of them are yeah. nonsense. Um, why is there anti-Semitism? Because they hate Jewish people. Why are they hating all those Jewish people? They will give you all of those answers. Why is there hatred? Uh, because it's a nature of men to be afraid and suspicious of someone that they do not know mm. uh, and, and, and cause some kind of um, animosity for something that they are not comfortable um, with. And, this is, and, and you know what? This is why I, I mentioned before, if anybody want to talk to me and know who I am as a Jew and as an Israeli, let's go have lunch. Let's go have coffee. You'll know who I am. I'll know who you are. It doesn't mean that we have to agree, but see me as human being with the right to live. See me and, and allow me the dignity to exist as a Jew and allow me the freedom to believe how I want to believe about God and humanity. And, um, and I will grant you the same. We are, we are in the same, we, we create a place where we can meet, where we can meet together as two human being. And, and, and that should be with Anybody and everybody from any different ethnic background, I think uh, if we understand the humanity and the dignity of all men, that we are all created equal uh, in the image of God, uh, that differences is um, enriching our lives, uh, then maybe we will understand why hate should not be there and why why evil should be eradicated. May I explain in in, in another way uh, my my idea of the dignity of all men and why is it so important and why diversity should be welcomed? Um, If I give you a box of crayons, right? If I give you a box of crayons and in in that box you have only red crayons and you're trying to create this beautiful picture, if you lose one of those crayons, are you going to be heartbroken? No. Why? Because I have plenty more. You have plenty more, right? But if I give you a box of crayon, and each crayon is a different color, and that's the only only one box, and each crayon, one of a kind, with its own color, and you're trying to create your beautiful multicolor picture, if you lose the red crayons, are you going to be heartbroken or disappointed? It's going to be a problem. Yeah. It's going to be a problem, right? Each one of us is a unique color. Each of our ethnicity, background, 
genetic makeup, faith, uh, outlook. It's all unique and special. Each one of us created in the image of God, as in each one of us is a crayon, and we have a purpose for our crayonness, for our existence. We have our own purpose, but nonetheless, our purpose is different. Um, and each one, of, each one of us is valued, not more or less than the others. Each one of us is valued. If one of us is, lo- is lost, the divine picture of harmony and color is going to be diminished with the loss of each one of us. It's a beautiful analogy. And this is why each one of us, the dignity of each one of us, the color of each one of us, if you will, with the analogy, is extremely important. And this is why we need to do whatever we can, that there is harmony among all of these colors, among all of these crayons. And rather than um, look with animosity for the difference, embrace the difference with with each other while we are holding strong to who we are, and, and what we believe and what we bring into the table. Um, and the more people will know about other people and, again, cherish who the other is and embrace their differences, um, the better we will be as, as a race, as the human race, and, and make this place a better place for all of us. That was so beautiful that I want to end on that, but I'm not going to end on that. How, how can folks... Jewish or not Jewish, help uh, in the cause to get to that place that you just described? What, what can we do at, uh, in, in a general sense and, and very tactically are there things that we can do to, to help the state of Israel or, or Jews worldwide? Uh, talk to us. Um, be vocal. Uh, vote. Um, if you're active in social media, do the right thing and like the right thing. And uh, be there, um, be there for for the sound of of reason, and and for those who um, spread peace, for those who talk about peace, um, and um, and if you have a, a Jewish friend, say hello. And if you don't have a Jewish friend, make an effort to do a Jewish friend. If you have a Jewish friend at work. Go to them and seek to understand. Ask what's going on. If you don't know or you don't understand what's going on, say, explain it to me. And if, you, and if your friend doesn't know, um, call me. <laughs> <laughs> call me. We'll still have coffee and we can talk about it. Uh, try to reach out. Try to reach out with a stretched hand for a handshake and for a conversation. So be, in, in, uh, be compassionate, show compassion. Yeah. Well, I thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it, uh, Rabbi Sherry. I am a better person now that I've met you. So uh, I'm glad we got to do this, and I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to wherever you listen to podcasts. We'd also really appreciate if you'd rate and review us. You can find us at scodopodcast.com.